The Turkish military aerospace sector has been blossoming in the last decade or so. In recent years, it has especially proliferated as an international supplier of unmanned aerial vehicles, and their product roster is growing ever larger and more interesting. How did they manage to squeeze past the industry behemoths such as the US, Israel and China? Watch this video to learn more about it. Yep, we made a bink of plushie. If you want one, for yourself or as a gift, do check out our Crowdmate store. The link is available below in the video description. It's not too small, not too big, perfect for your desk or your shelf next to your military history books. Or you can give it away. We've made it as low cost as humanly possible, which is very hard when you're contracting very small production runs. Bink of plushie costs $49.99, that's US dollars. Well, go ahead and treat yourself. 20 years ago, there were just two big players when it came to unmanned aerial vehicles, the US and Israel. The US had a monopoly on complex and large drones, while Israel managed to get a large piece of the smaller drone market, utilizing its price competitiveness compared to the US. Over time, Israeli firms got more ambitious and now they're a big player even in the medium drone segment. While the US refused to sell its advanced drones to anyone who asked, which cost it some market share. Then in the last 10 years or so, China also started selling its drones abroad. It was mostly to a specific list of countries to which it usually sold its weapons to. But over time, even some US allies reached for Chinese products, probably because of the US reluctance to sell their Predator and Reaper drones to anyone who asked for them. Before the Turkish aerospace sector started exporting drones in earnest, which started around 2017, the situation had Israel and the US as the pretty clear heavyweights in the market. Mind you, the source for the list shown, the CIPRI Institute, gives really just a rough estimate, despite the seemingly detailed figures. But since Turkey's UAVs started selling well, the situation changed completely. In the last five or so years, Turkey went from nowhere straight to the top of the pack. Again, those numbers are to be taken with a load of salt as they're a result of CIPRI trying to compile a dataset based on publicly available news reports. They are likely overestimating some figures while underestimating others. Tracking US sales is likely more transparent than tracking China's, for example. Also, large UAV sales are likely easier to be tracked than those of small UAVs. As far as Binkov can tell, many drones are not included in the list at all. Also, not all UAVs are the same, of course. Some are very potent, large and expensive, while others are simply small buzzers that don't provide nearly as much worth to their user. If the above list is adjusted so small and less potent drones are subtracted, then one would get this. Certainly a small little thing like the Scan Eagle or Aerostar is nowhere near as capable as a Turkish TB2, let alone a US Reaper or Chinese CH4. Here's a list of just some of the more popular drones and their maximum takeoff weights. Generally, a decade newer and superior technology can compensate for less mass and payload to a small degree, maybe even offer the same performance as a drone double the weight. But drones several times bigger are still going to be superior. They will offer a longer loiter time over target area, a higher flight ceiling, putting them out of reach of some threats, and a higher payload which directly translates to much longer-ranged sensors and even bigger weapons capability. One can see that the Turkish Bayraktar TB2 drone is situated in the middle of the pack. It offers a decent payload and decent capabilities for a fairly low price of just a few million dollars, seriously undercutting the US offerings. The US stopped producing its Predator drone in 2018 and basically left that market segment to other countries, its larger Reaper drone is way too expensive for many countries, while its shadow series of drones are too small to be competitive with the Turkish TB2. Israel does have a range of drones roughly near that ballpark, starting with the Searcher, the Hermes and ending with the Huron drone. But the Searcher is an obsolete design. The Hermes 450 is still a bit too small, while the larger Hermes 900 and Heron are just expensive enough that the TB2 manages to beat them on cost efficiency. Certainly, the TB2, according to those CIPRI lists, is basically the only Turkish drone that sells abroad. But boy, does it sell. It's not just about the low price tag, which is the result of the lower worker cost in Turkey compared to other countries. 
While China might compete on price due to its larger production volumes, it can't compete on politics. Chinese customers are still by and large the countries which have bought Chinese stuff before. Turkey, however, being a NATO member, gets to sell to pretty much whoever it wants. It gets the best of both worlds, selling to both Western and Eastern countries. While Israel is trying to cater to the same set of countries, their workforce can't match those Turkish price tags. So can any country do what Turkey did? Well, Turkey's aerospace industry didn't really do it overnight. Back in the Cold War and especially since the 1980s, Turkish firms got more and more work on Western systems. The F-16s were produced locally under a license, among other aircraft. Turkish firms worked with Airbus on commercial airliners and the A400M transport plane. As they consolidated under one firm, Turkish Aerospace Industries, they worked with Augusta Westland on the T129 attack helicopter, among other projects. There was a lot of technology transfer involved over the decades. Turkey was a desirable partner because it was in NATO, always close to the EU, and work could be done on the cheap. Ample money pumped by the Turkish government into the domestic aerospace sector also helped, not just fueling TAI, but other companies as well, making various subcomponents, weapons, and so on. Among those was the Baikar company, which rose from a subcontractor for certain parts to a designer and maker of the famous Bayraktar drone family. Turkey today covers a lot of needs for its aircraft. While there was a period when TB2 drones used foreign sourced sensors and engines, today's TB2 drones have those replaced with Turkish made equivalents. Baikar started with the mini Bayraktar in the mid 2000s and went on to bigger drones. Today the company turned itself into a major supplier of its country's armed forces. Alongside TAI, whose large Anka drones are also part of the Turkish military. With experience and many UAVs made, eventually exports came as well. The Turkish military's use of its drones over Syria helped show their usefulness. Turkish drones were also procured and used in Libya's civil war. But perhaps the biggest boon came from Azerbaijan in 2020. Following its success in the Nagorno-Karabakh war, many countries suddenly started seeking TB2 drones. Ukraine was also a user and TB2's performance against Russian forces was touted as successful by the media. Actual assessments will likely have to wait a few years after the war ends. In September 2022, a Turkish TV report said 420 Bayraktar drones were made so far, exported to 24 countries. Half of that number is likely serving in the Turkish military. Flush with all the profits, both Baikar and TAI have embarked on new projects. TAI has a large UAV called the Aksungur. It went into service with the Turkish military in 2021. Baikar has a somewhat similar but even larger Akinci drone. Interestingly, while the Aksungur is more of a typical recon drone, optimized for loiter time and thus close in weight and roll to the US Reaper drone, the Akinci is optimized to be an attack drone, basically a missile carrier. It's a curious concept. In a way, its role is somewhat similar to various flying wing combat drone proposals, uh, such as the Russian Okotnik drone, Chinese GJ-11 or the US never materialized X-47B project. That is, it is to deliver large weapons onto a target. But unlike those three drones, which are designed to be stealthy and fairly fast, meaning survivable, the Akinci is everything but. It's not stealthy and is quite slow. It's basically as vulnerable as any other small turboprop plane. While its price is not known, it can't be cheap either due to its complexity. So against an opponent with operational long-range air defenses, its usefulness might be limited. But against a less of a peer opponent, it might offer a cost-effective way to deliver a whole range of missiles and bombs. Far bigger than what drones like the TB2 could. Indeed, promotional materials have featured various standoff missiles and bombs launched from it, which may be crucial to its use. Ukrainian engines are currently used for the Akinci, as the Turkish industry currently lacks engines powerful enough for it. It is likely the war in Ukraine will have an impact on the supply of those engines. Another drone, called the TB3, double the weight of the TB2, will be used from Turkey's future drone carrier ship, and will even feature foldable wings. But perhaps the most interesting future project is Baikar's Kizilema drone. It is designed to be a jet-powered supersonic stealth drone, capable of operating from aircraft carriers. Design ideas were allegedly thrown around since 2013, 
but the project was disclosed to the public only in 2021. Like the Akinci, it is also dependent on an Ukrainian engine, so who knows how much that will slow down the project. Frankly, the whole project seems not very well focused. The makers are promoting so many things about it, including a twin-engine variant, a radar, air-to-air -air capability, air-to-ground capability, and so on, that it is questionable just what the biker company can deliver and in what time frame. Had it been the TAI developing a similar product, they could have been leveraging their experience on the upcoming stealthy man fighter, the TFX. However, for Baikar, a project like Kizilema seems like a huge reach. Given that we are really talking about the fighter jet sized aircraft with a bunch of advanced features, it may realistically not see active service before the end of the decade. And even then, it might not be comparable to other more expensive offerings. Nevertheless, it's evident Turkish companies are making great strides when it comes to drones, not sitting on their laurels, but trying to stay ahead of the curve, as no other country has quite the same technology base, geopolitical role and cheap workforce combination, it's plausible Turkey will indeed remain a powerful player in the drone business. As long as the politics of it all remain favorable, and Turkey does not get sanctioned by the US, its drone future will keep looking bright. Now, before we go, the entire Binkov's team wishes you the best in this new year. Thank you for watching us. Thank you for your support if you've joined our Patreon page. We plan to bring you an interesting video next week on the topic of what needs to happen for the war in Ukraine to end. Certainly, there's been too much death and destruction already. Let us hope that by the next New Year's, we will see some peace there. And remember, Binkov may talk about war, but only real peace can bring us all together.